Hello and welcome to the Venture Forth Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Mahavutivani. We'll be chatting with some of the most interesting founders, startups, and VCs about the experiences that led them to where they are today, what they're currently working on, as well as the journey ahead of them. On today's show, I'm very excited to welcome Kara Golden, founder and CEO of Hint Water. Kara created Hint as a healthy alternative to soda and also thought that plain water was simply too boring. Hint has also been seen on HBO's Silicon Valley and has also enjoyed thousands of times daily in the offices of some of the world's largest tech companies, including Google, Apple, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can also find it in retailers all over the country. Kara's startup story is quite different than most you'll hear in Silicon Valley. Hint was actually her first venture as a founder. Before that, she helped build publishing and tech startups that are now household names, including Time Magazine, CNN, and then AOL, where she ran their online commerce business. Then, 12 years ago, she found herself between jobs and facing the uphill battle of trying to get healthy. You know, I never thought to myself, okay, one day when I really get to do what I want to do. I'm going to go start a beverage company. I mean, instead, it was it was kind of an accidental startup in many ways, because I was really going through a time when I was trying to lose weight. I had developed terrible adult acne that I didn't even have as a kid. And I thought, you know, I really like want to figure out while I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with the rest of my life, I want to figure out how I actually get healthy. And how I, you know, live the best life that I can live. And and in addition to that, I had young kids, I have four kids. Um, But at that time, I, I was uh, had three kids. And I thought, I want to make sure that they don't have any health issues either. And, and, you know, it's funny, because I, I uh, look back on the time and people ask me, you know, was I sick? It wasn't that I was like, obviously sick. I mean, as my friends used to say, I I wore my weight well, I was like, a little heavy, but it wasn't like I was obese by any means. And you know, the acne is is not something that is terribly unusual. But for me, it was. And so I just, I really just thought, here's a time when I have time because I'm in between jobs to really pay attention and focus. And that's when I just decided, gosh, I'm really interested in in this. And I was waking up every day and thinking, gosh, you know, I'm like doing all the right things. I'm exercising. I'm like feeling like I'm doing everything that I should be doing. And yet I'm not really getting as healthy as I want to be. So that's what was so upsetting to me. I really thought that you know, if I was eating something that had zero calories or very low calories, that that was going to be healthier for me. And one day I just decided uh, to look at my Diet Coke that I was drinking and saw that it just had a lot of ingredients that I didn't understand. And so because I didn't understand what they were, I decided to eliminate them from my life. And once that happened, uh, two and a half weeks later, I lost over 20 pounds then in about six months, I lost almost 50 pounds. Wow. And so, yeah, it was pretty crazy. And, and I, you know, really started to be, you know, become more and more aware of not just what I was putting into my body, but what I was putting on my body. And, you know, what I've realized is how just because things get approved, it could mean that they have better lobbyists and things just kind of get pushed through because somebody knew somebody. And um, it's not necessarily having the consumers back. Right. Um, as a founder myself, like I've started companies, built software and, and, and that sort of thing, um, especially being here, like that's what we know. But what did you know about the food and beverage industry before starting Hint? You know, I can't say that I always wanted to be in food and beverage. My dad was actually in food um, at ConAgra. So he actually launched Healthy Choice um, oh, wow. many, many, many years ago. So I had sort of grown up around you know, being in the food and beverage industry, but I really felt like that wasn't um, necessarily something that I was going to do. I mean, when I left college, I thought I I really wanted to write initially. And I thought if I can go, you know, write for any publication, I I really thought I'd love to go and work for um, Fortune magazine because I really believed that they, in a very simple way, taught me how to understand finance. And so I aspired to work at something that was 
you know, aspirational like that, that I thought was doing it in a simple way. So I always view like every piece of my career as, as a stepping point, but I didn't think it was a stepping point at the time. You end up doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? If you sort of allow that to kind of happen. So, and that's how I got to hint. As somebody who loves hint water, um, particularly hint fizz, particularly watermelon hint fizz, the name of the the product is is super important. And, and when I first met you, uh, you had been presenting about branding, and I'm curious about how you kind of came upon the hint name and, and developed the brand, the bottle, and and all that. Yeah. So we never hired a branding agency. I mean, it was really it, it initially when I thought about you know what do I call this product, and I was telling my husband that I was going to start this company. He uh, he said, you know, what's the name of this company? And I said, well, you know, it's it's just got a little bit of flavor in it, and and then water, and and uh, but I was thinking that, you know, again, I was in this crazy time when I was having young kids, and and I uh, I don't know if any any other mothers or fathers out there call it this, but when I was giving my kids their initial like sippy cup, I was calling it Wawa, <laughs> and so I don't know if I'm the only crazy mother that did that but so I so I was like here have your Wawa and I, I was like gosh maybe it's like Wawa I mean that'd be that'd be really great and my husband looked at me and he said so there's this major chain uh, convenience tra- chain on the east coast in Pennsylvania called Wawa so if you really like <laughs> actually get somewhere with this product they'll crush you like a bug and it's probably not a good idea to call it Wawa. And so, um, so he said, just keep talking to me about it. And, and then as I started to, you know, talk to him about it more and, and started to describe it more, he said, so you keep calling it Hint. And I said, yeah, Hint. Like just, you know, that's really interesting. Is it a hint of flavor? Is it that we're giving people hints? I don't know, but that'd be really great. We could call it hint and he looked at me you know being the attorney and and said so hint is a four letter word there is no way that you're going to get the trademarks for this name and i was like well you know you can't get it if you don't try and so he is like okay fair enough and so we registered for it and today we have uh worldwide trademarks for uh beverage on the word hint and we also have it on personal care we just recently launched outside of beverage into sunscreens um so that's very exciting as well definitely i i actually want to come back to sunscreens in a little bit because i find that to be super fascinating uh as sort of a new new line uh, for the brand um but when i'm thinking about building a business like hint there seems to be like lots of decisions that you have to make before jumping into the business whether it's like you're going with sparkling or still water um flavors the whether to go with plastic glass or 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 cans how did you make some of these decisions it seems like they're very integral to actually building your brand you know, we've always been in plastic bottles um, since day one, but we actually tried glass bottles a few years ago when we were launching our carbonated version of our product. And um, we primarily did it not for any other reason except that we felt like a cold carbonated beverage really tastes great in glass. And so we thought, you know, let's give it a try and, and plus it actually holds the bubbles longer if you're um, if you're in a glass bottle as well and so we did that and we you know continued to have our still product in the regular you know plastic bottles that we've always had the PET you know no BPA plastic bottles and finally we started really looking at you know the the whole glass issue and and the most troubling part of glass for us was that it was actually taking three times more energy to produce Mm. a glass product versus a plastic product. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize this. I certainly hadn't really thought about it, but glass, for example, I mean, gone are the days where you go and return your glass bottles to the grocery store. And, you know, when I was a kid, they used to actually, you return them and then they'd actually wash the glass bottles. And, they send them back into the bottling plant to actually be refilled. 
And so today what happens, nobody does that process anymore. Today what happens is they don't wash the bottles. It actually goes into a recycling bin and it's crushed into a sand Mm. um, product. And then actually the process starts all over again. And so what we realized is that there was an enormous amount of energy that was actually going into that process that we really weren't very comfortable with. And so then we looked at, you know, plastic bottles and thought, you know, this is much better because they're actually recycled into things like T-shirts and laundry detergent bottles, as well as things like park benches, too. So we thought, Mm. like, it's definitely sort of a better alternative. But then we also started to look at cans because we thought, you know, we get a better shelf life with cans and they're cheaper than plastic bottles. And But the reality is, is that today in the U.S., all of our cans are lined with BPA. You know, the things that they had removed from plastic bottles years ago, BPA, are now in all cans. So the reason that BPA was removed is because it was a hormone disruptor. And so, you know, we've just decided as a company, that I don't want to produce a product in cans knowing that the actual product is touching BPA. I just don't think it's a great, great idea. Kara also refused to add preservatives. Hint was one of the first water products to use pasteurization instead for an 18-month shelf life. Turns out, Kara also gave her idea an 18-month shelf life to see if it was even feasible enough to get outside funding. So I'm guessing that Hint must be then VC-backed. Was it difficult convincing VCs to invest in this business? So we've actually financed the company a little bit differently. Um, We initially, the first uh, 18 months, we didn't take any financial backing at all. We really, you know, I, I viewed it as a time when I was getting, you know, kind of my MBA and in food and beverage and and really understanding it because it it truly was such a different thing than what I had been, you know, used to doing in in publishing and then in tech. And so I um I just I didn't want to take any of anybody's money. And I fortunately had some extra savings that I was able to, you know, kind of put towards this. And so my husband and I um I actually brought him into the company pretty early on. Um, He was the first employee of the company outside of me. And uh, basically, he was in tech as well. He was uh, an attorney at Netscape. And so we both like sort of looked at it as like, wow, this is really interesting and, and always thought about it not as, again, like starting a beverage company, but about if we could actually get people to eliminate sugar and sweeteners from their life. So basically... At 18 months, we we had friends and family that were, you know, really excited about what we were doing and wanting to support us. And so we started to look at, you know, should we actually take some capital? And and so we did. And then after uh, we did that, one of our distributors actually asked if he could invest in us as well. And so that ended up happening. And then we ended up getting a phone call from somebody who was with the Stella beer family um, out of Brussels and they invested. And then since then we've had a number of individuals. We have over a hundred individuals um, involved in, in the company from a financing perspective. And, you know, we haven't taken any private equity into the company. It's really been about, you know, individuals as well as family offices. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. That's awesome. I, so my first interaction, uh, the first time I ever tried Hint was when uh, when I was uh, interviewing at, at Google, and uh, during one of the breaks, I, I reached for um, a Hint in the in the fridge, and so it, I I'm really curious about how you've been, managed to get Hint into all these great tech companies, um, and really like I guess we're potentially the first adopters of the product. Yeah, so you know it's not that crazy of a story. It's a lot of people have been like, oh, wow, you know, you guys must have really focused on it and, and made it happen. But, you know, it was funny. We, um, I had a friend who was very early at Google, um, Omid Cortesani. And Omid um, one day was talking to me actually about joining Google. 
And I said, hey, why don't I come and actually sit down with you and kind of hear more about the opportunity. And as we were talking, I, you know, had said that I was, I had started this company and, you know, I wasn't sure exactly that I had to focus on it super like full time because it was kind of on autopilot. And, you know, I was excited about sort of the progress that we had made and, and telling him about it. And then finally, somewhere along the way, he was like, oh, you know, we're going to start having food and beverages available to all of our employees here. You should really talk to the guy who runs food and beverage. And so he handed me, you know, the guy's name and said, you know, you should reach out to him. And I, I sort of was half listening, you know, when it, when he was <laughs> telling me, right? Like I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I I think I found the card a couple of days later and, and said, okay, great. I'm going to do that. And then I ended up reaching out to him and he was like, oh, yeah, definitely. We'll test it. You know, you're a friend of Omid's and happy to test it. And so so we gave him some product and then he called us a few days later and he's like, wow, you, you know, people really like the product a lot. And how much can we wholesale it from you for? And and so that's really how it started. And, you know, it's funny. People said, well, then how would you get into all these other tech firms? And you know, people move on from jobs and, and then they call us and, and know that we're a San Francisco company. And basically, I mean, it's a pretty simple, like that's how it really got going. You know, we were responsive to people, right? Which I think in any industry, you have to be responsive. But I think also, you know, the key thing is that we were solving a problem for people, which was just like me trying to eliminate sugar and sweeteners from my diet. And that was like something that really resonated with other people. Cost is actually something I, I wanted to touch upon as well. Um, in let's say target, for instance, you know, I think hint retails for like a dollar 50 or so a bottle. Um, mm-hmm. And there's another extremely popular brand out there. Um, LaCroix that is, you know, I guess about like 40 or 50 cents a can you know, if you're at a grocery store, how do you make Hint stand out from competitors like that? Well, I think, you know, LaCroix is, you know, a very different product. I mean, first of all, they're focused on carbonated products. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a large percentage of people that actually don't want carbonation. So, you know, I think that they're probably closer to soda than actually water. Um, But having said that, we offer both still water as well as carbonated water. We also have a caffeinated version of our product, too, that is actually a super hot seller. But I think that the key thing for us is really, you know, A, offering choice, B, also using real ingredients, you know, especially if you're buying a product. I just think consumer rights to be able to to know exactly what's in their products is becoming more and more important for consumers to actually understand what they're what they're buying. So how many bottles of Hint have been sold to date, if you if you can say? God, I don't even know. <laughs> I mean, we're like, you know, every year we're we're growing significantly. So we've never since we've started had a down year. We're profitable as a company now, which is super exciting. I tell entrepreneurs that, you know, that was a huge focus, and we would hear from people who would say, um, you know, why are you focused on getting profitable? And, you know, it was just something that we really wanted to do, and I and I have to tell you that, you know, the world kind of changes when you do get profitable. You know, just different opportunities open up for you that Certainly. I think are unique. Awesome. So there has been some, some I guess, consolidation in the beverage industry. Have any of the larger companies uh, approached you for a potential acquisition? You know, we talk to everybody, and we've had many conversations over the years. And um, look, a lot of these companies just really are not um, – a lot of these large companies that sort of have the ability to, you know, get into acquisition, they're just not really brand builders, mm. right? They're really – Operators. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're good at scaling companies, but they're not really good at, you know, incubating and developing. And, you know, I, I think even if companies like have innovation teams within the larger teams, I mean, most, most times, sadly, I feel like, you know, people who are sent to go and work on innovation teams are not necessarily 
treated in a way that is valued, right? right? Like I think there, it's more about, oh, go work on this interesting project. And then, you know, oftentimes if the company isn't doing well, then, you know, they get eliminated because then it's like, oh, well, you were working on innovation and we don't, we're not innovating. We're just <laughs> trying to save our butt, right? And right. so, you know, that's what I've seen over the years that I think is, is frankly just really interesting right. to say the least. You, you touched upon this uh, a little bit earlier, but uh, Hint is starting to move into to new markets and in new uh, verticals specifically. Can you tell us how you decided to kind of make the jump from water now into into sunscreen? Yeah, so um, about three years ago, I uh, had a little scare with a um, pre-cancer cell thing on my nose that oh. was uh, just a dry patch on my nose that, you know, frankly, I think a lot of people have and I just started paying more and more attention to it and finally decided to just have it removed and after getting it removed I started wearing sunscreen religiously and and then you know went down to my local CVS and bought what I thought was like the best sunscreen and then in my you know foundation that I was wearing every day I was also making sure that I had SPF in that and finally uh, I uh, started seeing that the precancer cell thing was growing at even a faster rate than it had when I wasn't wearing sunscreen. And I went back to my dermatologist and, and sort of had this conversation with her about it and asking a lot of questions. And then finally decided, okay, what is it that's causing, you know, this thing to grow? I mean, it's just crazy. Is it really, you know, too much exposure to sun or could it be something else? And so there's a lot of people out there, especially, you know, people who have grown up in Europe who don't necessarily think that sunscreens are even a good option at all. And I started, you know, having conversations with people about that. And then finally, I thought, I don't know, I think it's like probably an important thing to do to, to wear sunscreen. But is it actually the ingredients that go into a lot of these sunscreens? That's the issue. So finally, it saw that the consistent ingredient with both of these things that I was wearing was an, an active ingredient in sunscreen called oxybenzone. And I decided that I didn't like what I was researching on oxybenzone. For example, it was approved in the 70s, in the mid-1970s. And um, at the time that it was approved, there was a lot of question about the product, including there were some studies that showed that oxybenzone could possibly exasperate precancer cell growth. I mean, this is in the 70s, right? And somehow it ended up getting approved. And everybody I talked to who sort of understood ingredients, I, I said, you know, if this is the case, then why was it approved? And people said, because it's cheap. It's a cheap sunscreen ingredient. And, and at the end of the day, you know, things get pulled off of the shelf after they've been approved by the FDA only if somebody, you know, dies from it, right? <laughs> and so and so what's really interesting is that for sunscreen, it's very, very hard to actually pinpoint that it's the sunscreen when you think about it because people are putting on sunscreen every day and then if they get skin cancer, then the answer is always, oh, they got too much sun. It's never like, well, wait a minute, is it because they were also wearing sunscreen and could the sunscreen have caused this problem to be exasperated, right? And so I thought about, you know, more and more that, you know, I certainly don't want to be wearing this. And finally, I, I uh, decided to search for a sunscreen that didn't have oxybenzone in it and found a great sunscreen that was available at my dermatologist. But my biggest issue with it was that it was expensive. It was like $46 a bottle. And I thought, you know, $46 for a bottle of sunscreen to most people is expensive, Definitely. right? And, and especially if you've got a spray and you're spraying it on. So I started playing around in, in my kitchen again uh, with the product and, and started to, you know, really look at, you know, what can I add to this product that is going to keep the sun from affecting me, but also can I add some of my scents that I was using in the water to actually make the product smell better? Because that was another thing that I saw in the sunscreen category was that 
nobody was really wedded to their sunscreen. And I think that the scent is, is such an important aspect. I mean, people like to wear things that smell good. And I really believe we were like sitting on something that was like, you know, it needed disruption. And so I thought, I don't know, what the heck, I'll just, you know, take a whack at it and see what happens. And so I learned after like I had come up with the formula that I actually had to get FDA compliance because the fruit that was in the product was not again, what is usually used in um, sunscreens. And so I was really, really surprised that, you know, most of these products are not using real stuff mm. in, in the product. And so it took us 18 months to get the approval and then finally got it in December. And then we've been selling it online and uh, since December, and our plan is to really take it into the market in January. I were in some select stores in the Bay Area, um, primarily in some doctor's offices, my doctor's office, for example. Um, but for the most part, we've really like focused on, you know, where can we get it into that just to sort of see what the response is, because frankly, we didn't know, you know, and we didn't know what the response was going to be. And, you know, it, interestingly, we had sent it out. We have a pretty big direct-to-consumer business at, at drinkhint.com for our water product, and we sent out a letter to our existing base of subscribers. Um, actually, not just subscribers, but anyone who had purchased over the last 12 months and saw just a crazy number. It was over 60% of our people who had purchased over the last 12 months then went ahead and bought the sunscreen in January, which I thought you know, was, was really interesting. It's online at drinkhint.com now, but it's, but it'll be in more stores. Um, I think Target has actually uh, agreed to take it in, in January, um, which will be really exciting. You, I mean, you've started a, a water company, you started now, well, I guess it also encompasses sunscreen, um, and done so much in, in the tech business. Uh, is there something else that uh, you want to do on your bucket list? I think the way that we think about the company is is really uh, the consumers running this company and what can we do to solve problems that are so obvious to us but are so surprising to so many consumers when they actually hear about it. So we're totally open to, you know, doing products in other companies. I frankly don't think we need to do like some other big lifestyle brands that we I don't think we need to really you know, launch a company with 5,000 SKUs in it, I think we can really focus on really solving problems in specific categories and, and still become a billion dollar brand. Definitely. I, I can certainly see it going there. And uh, uh, I know that people would really appreciate that internationally as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to take some time to uh, kind of wrap up here with some quick fire questions. Perfect. Uh, so what is your favorite book? Favorite book, uh, probably the originals. Do you do you know that? I don't. Book. Uh, it's Adam Grant, um, and uh, I met Adam Grant shortly after reading the book. Uh, he actually gave an amazing TED talk um, at one point, but he really talks about how you know entrepreneurs do not come in one shape or, or size. That you know they have. There's a lot of different backstories. I think the consistent thing is passion mm -hmm. and sort of disruption. And uh, actually, he told me that if he would have met me before uh, publishing the book, he probably would have put me in there as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, what is your favorite flavor of Hint? You know, I rotate a lot. I love our cherry fizz. And... We also do these things called smash ups, which are primarily online where there are sort of limited um, number of product that we produce. And, and so I, I would have to say that that would probably be part of it as well. Mm, I can't wait to try that, actually. So I'd love to give you this opportunity to plug anything that you like. You know, I think more than anything, for me, it's really about awareness and you know, helping people think about what they do every day. But I think also really looking at companies that you're supporting and and people that you're supporting and making sure that if you are supporting these companies that they're really 
doing the right things and sort of adding in a valuable way to the economy. Uh, Kara, thank you so much for being on the Venture Forth podcast today. And it's been such a pleasure to share your story today. Yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciate you inviting me. Absolutely. And, and to all the listeners out there, go out and try Bottle Hint and ask your company to stock it, especially watermelon. It's Yay! seriously great stuff. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, you have been listening to Kara Golden, founder and CEO of Hint Water on the Venture Forth podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe to the Venture Forth podcast on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. You can also follow at Venture Forth Pod on Twitter for our latest updates. As always, I'm your host, Joe Mahavutivani, and thank you for listening to the Venture Forth podcast.